Hello and welcome to this uh, second of my Rates and Orders clips, this time looking at graphical methods and the rate determining step. So we'll look at different types of graphs we can use to determine the reaction rate, uh, plus some common themes in the mechanisms that might help you work out a possible rate determining step when you have a multi-step reaction mechanism. So all these require what's called a continuous monitoring method. So there's different ways of doing this. Uh, you could, uh, for example, measure the change in mass per unit time, or you could measure the change in gas volume per unit time. These two examples give you the same reaction. In this case, the reaction of magnesium with hydrochloric acid. So another technique that could be used is uh, colorimetry, where a colorimeter could be used to monitor changes in intensity of a colour in the reaction mixture. And this could be used as an indicator of the rate of reaction. So when you use a colorimeter, you first have to do a calibration curve, like we can see on the left of the screen. So you start off by preparing a series of samples of unknown concentration of the substance being tested for and run them through the calorimeter, or sorry, colorimeter I should say. This will give you a series of absorbances for each concentration, which tells you pretty much how much light was absorbed. Then you plot the absorbances against concentration, as you can see on the left. So now you can use the graph to extrapolate and find your unknown concentration. So this is how you create the calibration curve. So if you carry out your reaction and take samples of your coloured chemical as the reaction proceeds, what you can do then is plot a concentration time graph to determine the order of reaction with respect to the coloured chemical. So once your concentration time graph is plotted, you can then use the gradient at t equals zero to work out the initial rate. You could then go and repeat this process several times at different concentrations and do the initial rates graph or initial rates method, or you could look at the shape of the curve, the pink curve, and the fact that the graph is curved and slowly levels out shows the reaction to be first order. Now, the gradient at any given point is going to be the rate of reaction. So for as the reaction concentration decreases, so does the gradient at the same rate. So this gives us an idea of how to use the gradient to work out the order. So if we look at the gradient this time, it remains unchanged, in spite of the drop in reaction concentration. So in this case, the shape suggests that it's zero order with respect to that particular reactant. In fact, you can plot either rate time graphs or concentration time graphs and use their shapes to get the order. So if we look at zero order graphs, the rate is unaffected by concentration in a rate versus time and the gradient is unaffected by concentration in a concentration versus time. So moving on to first order, if you look at the rate versus time graph, the gradient is still um, the same, but what's happening is the rate increases with the concentration. So as the concentration goes up, so does the rate. In a concentration versus time graph, however, the gradient of the curve decreases in proportion. So we'll come on to the actual gradient and what that means in a second. In a second order, in both cases, we'll look at the whole, point, whole picture. The gradient remains unchanged for zero order. In first order, for rate versus time, gradient unchanged. But in first order, for concentration versus time, the gradient decreases with consistency. In second order, concentration versus time, it decreases more sharply. So if you take the half-life uh, of one of these curves, and the half-life turns out to remain unchanged, then that tells you the reaction is first order with respect to that reactant. In fact, you can use the half-life to work out the rate constant. 
So if you take the log to the base e, or natural log of 2, divide it by the half-life, you can get the rate constant. So if let's say you wanted to work out that from this graph, looking at the graph you can see that the um, half-life is roughly 55 seconds. So therefore, um, if we take the natural log for 2, which is 0 0.693147108 divide it by 55, it gives you 0 0.01260267601 as a rate constant. So let's say you want to work out the value for the rate constant, that would be one way of doing it. So let's now look at the rate determining step. So if we consider it a multi-step mechanism of any kind, it doesn't matter whether it's a mechanism you've studied or whether it's a new one, it's the slowest step in that multi-step mechanism. So the slowest step will determine how quickly the whole thing happens. A bit like a, a slow car in front of a fast one on a one-way street, for example. The number of moles of each of the reactants in the rate determining step will be the same as their orders of, in the rate equation, or the number of molecules of each of the reactants in the rate determining step. It could be that way. And the thing to remember is bond breaking is endothermic. So bond breaking steps, such as breaking the carbon-iodine bond, in this particular mechanism is likely to be slow. The bonding of the OH- to the partially positive carbon is likely to be fast. In electrophilic addition, for example, the carbon-carbon pi bond uh, in the CC double bond is broken, so this step needs energy, it's endothermic, so it's going to be slower. That would be in the rate-determining step. But in the next stage, the bromide ion reacts quickly with the carbocation, this is exothermic bond making, so this is going to happen more quickly, so this is going to be a fast step. This will not be in the rate determining step. Now, the reactions that you'll come across, or the examples you'll come across, will require you to work out a possible um, rate determining step or a possible multi step mechanism given some of the information. It's quite difficult in a video clip to go through all the different permutations that this could come across. So being able to deduce this in a natural example requires practicing them first, which I'm going to leave you to go and do. But what I've hopefully done is given you a few pointers of things that are common to all rate-determining steps. So to recap, first of all, they're the slowest step in your multi-step mechanism. The number of moles of each of the reactants in the rate determining step will be the same as their orders in the rate equation. And finally, because bond breaking is endothermic, any bond breaking steps are likely to be slow and therefore found in the rate determining step. Okay, so hopefully this has been a fairly useful clip just to get you started. Thanks for listening and until next time, see you soon.